Good morning, fellowship. I'd like to invite everybody to worship with us this morning. Our rock, the only solid ground The nations rise and fall Kingdoms once strong, now shaken The trust forever in your name The name of Jesus We trust the name of Jesus justice you will reign and every knee will bow we bring our expectations our hope is anchored in your name the name of jesus oh we trust the name of jesus Heavenly Father, I, I want to thank you for just being there with us. You're always there with us in the, the highs and the lows. The same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow, our firm foundation. Everyone, I, I just, like right now, I want you to, to raise your hands if you feel so so inclined. Raise your hands like you're lifting your banner. I want you to welcome the presence of the Spirit. He's here with us right now, but just welcome Him into you, you know, to your souls and feel Him. He led you here for a reason. You're supposed to hear something. You're supposed to feel something, but you're here right now. Allow yourself to feel it. And just ask Him, lift our banners high. And we live we lift the name of Jesus from age to age you reign your kingdom has no end we lift our banner high we lift the name of Jesus from age to age you reign your kingdom has no end you are the only king forever almighty God we lift you high
Jesus, I'm desperate. Oh, Jesus, I'm weary. Jesus, I'm calling, calling for you. Hoping you hear me. Praying you see me. Searching for
satisfy only you can satisfy only you can satisfy oh lord you satisfy living water quench my soul cleanse my heart come make We just thank you for this morning, God. We just ask that you would open our eyes to see you this morning, that you would open our ears to hear your truths, Lord, to just rest in who you are. And we just pray that you would bless this message and allow us to just know your love for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, good morning. Go ahead and turn to someone next to you and say good morning <laughs> good morning fellowship of the rockies how are we today Good. Oh, awake this morning on a Labor Day weekend. <laughs> Welcome to Fellowship of the Rockies. We're so glad you decided to join us for worship. Before we continue with the opening of God's Word, we have a few announcements for you. And the first one is going to be from Pastor April. 
Good morning. We just want to welcome you, and I wanted to invite you to our night of worship that's coming up this week. It's Wednesday, September 4th, here in this room at 6.30 p.m. We would love to have you join us. If you've never been to a night of worship, it's just a special night where we have extended time of worship and prayer together, uh, and it's our prayer that you would leave refreshed and encouraged by the presence of God. Uh, you don't have to be a member to come. You can invite anyone you want, friends and family, and we really hope to see you there. Once again, that is this Wednesday here in this room at 6.30 30 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, April. A couple of announcements I have for you. The first being our discipleship classes. They're going to be starting Wednesday, September 11th um, at 6.30 p.m. One of the ones I want to highlight real quick is our foundations class. This is going to be led by Pam and Annie Cuddle, uh, and this is a great class if you just got questions about Jesus, you have questions about the Bible, maybe you're new to the faith, this would be a great opportunity for you to come and learn and have great discussions with Pam and Andy. So if you want more information about foundations or any other of the classes, there's a table out in the foyer, and you can get all the information you want with those classes. The next announcement I have is for uh, our family dinners as well. So along with these classes, three nights uh, we're going to have family dinners. That's going to be September 11th, October 2nd, and November 6th. Now, that being said, it'd be really awkward if you just came to the dinner and then didn't stay for the classes. So you might as well sign up for the classes and then come to the dinners as well. So again, those are going to be uh, September 11th, October 2nd, and November 6th, and they are sponsored by our men's, women's, and seniors ministry. And then the final announcement I have is our women's kickoff event this Saturday, September 7th at 10 a.m. Uh, it's titled Just Start, and registration is open right now. So if you haven't registered yet, women, go and register. It's going to be a great event. We're looking forward to it. And then finally, the uh, last thing I want to mention is our giving. There are many ways to give here at Fellowship of the Rockies. They're all on the screen right there. You can mail, you can go to the website, um, you can put the envelope in the back, or you can text to give. When you give here at Fellowship of the Rockies, not only do you support our staff and uh, keep the lights on and support our ministries, but it is an act of obedience to God. God calls us to give. God calls us to be faithful with our giving, with our resources. So when we give, not only do we help support us, but you also give in obedience and faithfulness to God. So if you'd like to give, those are the ways to give on screen. Um, I'm going to pray over the offering, and then we will open God's word together. So if you bow your heads with me. Lord, you are good. Lord, we thank you for just the opportunity to come and be in your presence this morning. I thank you for um, all the people that are so willing to give of their resources and of their time here at Fellowship of the Rockies and into this community. Lord, we thank you for all that you do, and we can't wait to see what you're going to do. In your name I pray. Amen. Oh, sorry, Charlie. Excuse me, good morning. <laughs> I thought Josh was going to pray longer. <laughs> no, not really. I was running late. Uh, we're, we're, we're glad you are, you're here this morning. I, I just want to tell you, uh, kind of along the lines of some of the things Josh said as well, is I'm, I, just, I am so appreciative of you and the way that you give to this church. It allows us uh, to send a lot of money out of here. And so many of you know that Single Mom's Oil Change is coming up. And for those of you that may be new to fellowship, you're not aware of that, uh, we changed the oil for single moms for totally free. And so we have 60 ministry partners that are serving in that, uh, have already signed up, but we have maxed out. This is gonna be a record number. We have squeezed single moms in, and so we're gonna change the oil of 100 single moms in a day for free, uh, for free. And then also when they show up, uh, we have other ministries for them as well, whether it's for their children, whether it's because they're going to wait a little bit. And so we're going to help them with some things and we're going to minister to them. And so it's more than just changing the oil uh, in their cars. It, it, it is ministry, but also it's because of your giving that there's a church in Kiev in, in the Ukraine that's still standing because of you. As many of you know, when the war broke out in the Ukraine, uh, we, as a friend of mine, Pastor Igor, uh, we quickly started resourcing them, getting money into the Ukraine, and as a result of that, that church is still standing. Pastor Igor sent me a video this last week. It's shocking how close the missiles and the bombs are coming to, uh, to um, I just forgot the name of his church. Uh, it'll come to me later. It's still early. Maybe I haven't had enough coffee. And so, uh, and so it's shocking how close the bombs are coming. Uh, but the community center that we basically built is still standing in Kiev. Uh, we outfitted it because of your giving with washers and dryers uh, um, and, and refrigerators and storage areas to where many of the people have lost electricity or uh, they've lost their homes, and there's no way to keep their food refrigerated and stored and some of those other things are to do, the, do, do their laundry. 
And it's because of us that that, that church is, is, is still standing. And so I just want to tell you thank you uh, that because of your giving, we're able to be involved in, in these things. So if you have your Bibles and electronic devices and you'd like to follow along or, or, or read along, whether it's old school Bible or whether it's electronic device, handheld device of some sort, you're free to do that. James chapter 2 verses 15 or verses 14 through 26 is, we are to, is where we are today. And James, and I've warned you all the way through this series, James is pretty upfront. James is pretty much in your face. James is not a beat around the bush type of guy. And so he, he, just, he just tells it like it is. And, and so this morning, he's going to really lay it on the line about this issue of authentic faith. And so I want to talk to you this morning just out of the scriptures about this issue of authentic faith, uh, how to know that you have your real faith. Now listen, we're going to look at a group of scriptures that James is talking about, and it may be one of the most controversial scriptures uh, in, in the New Testament, because some believe that James may have been contradicting what Paul had said in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 8 and 9, and, and, and actually he's not contradicting it, he is complimenting what, what Paul has said. Paul has said that salvation is by grace through faith prepared for good works. The, the, the way that we meet Christ is by grace. It is by his grace through faith, and then he prepares us for good works. Now listen, just a little bit of the context. Paul and James were fighting two different false beliefs. They were fighting two different enemies, if you will. Paul was fighting legalism. Paul was fighting this issue of legalism that you've got to keep the Jewish laws, you've got to keep the rituals, you've got to, you've got to work your way. In other words, works based, you've got to work your way to heaven. So Paul is fighting that. James is fighting something that I think we fight in our day that it's easier for us to relate to. James is fighting this issue of indifference. James is fighting this issue of of indifference. James is fighting this issue of, of like, like laziness, if you will. James is helping us to know how to behave as a Christian, how to show that you're a Christian, how to prove that you're, you're a Christian. So when you look at Paul, Paul focused on the root of salvation. James focuses on the fruit of salvation. Those are two entirely different things. Paul was saying, this is how you know you're a believer. It's by grace through faith. And then prepared for, for good works. And James is talking about how to, how to behave as a believer. So it's not a contradiction. James is coming along and he, he's complimenting, if you will, what, what Paul was saying. And so he's saying it's not just faith. Or Paul is not, or James is not saying it's just faith. James is saying it's this issue of grace, that grace comes into your life through faith and created for us to do good work. So when you look at this, they are complementing one another in this scripture. So when we look at this issue, what Paul said, and we'll look at what James says, but while Paul says it is by grace through faith that you're changed, right? Grace is an amazing thing, wouldn't you say? I mean, grace is an amazing concept. That you can have the grace of God. Grace is an amazing concept until you have to extend it to someone else, right? Grace is an amazing concept until you have to extend it to someone that you don't think is deserving. Grace is an amazing concept until you have to apply it to somebody else, right? I mean, this happened to me yesterday. We drove up to Colorado Springs. I had a granddaughter. We watched her cheer, and like she's a little cheerleader now. And so we watched her cheer in two games. It was brutally hot sitting in the stands. And then my son-in-law, um, not my son-in-law, my grandson uh, started in his first football game. So we watched his, his game. And so we were in the stadium. We're in the stands for a very long time. And there's signs on the stadium that says, no pets allowed, no dogs allowed. Well, the people next to me had a poodle. They had a poodle, and I'm not against poodle. If you're a poodle person, God bless you, but I'm not against poodles. But she had a poodle in the stands, and for some odd reason, this poodle somewhere throughout the game decided to start licking my leg. And I had to, my family thought it was hilarious, and I had to extend grace to someone that I didn't think deserved it. Just like, read the sign, just read the sign. And so grace, grace is an unbelievable concept until we come to the place that we got to we got to extend it to someone else. Grace is this thing, what the definition is, is unmerited favor. See, we're used to earning favor. We're used to working for our favor on a humanistic level. But mercy, mercy is this. Mercy is different. It's not getting what we deserve. So let me illustrate it this way because we have to understand this. Let me illustrate it this way. If I have a problem at my home and I have a plumbing problem and it floods the basement, call a contractor, he shows up the house, and he says, I'm going to fix it. He fixes it, he takes care of the problem, and then he looks at me and he says, hey, 
He says, I feel so sorry for you. I'm not going to charge you labor. I'll just charge you parts. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to charge you labor today. So that would be called, that would be called grace. And so you're totally wrong. I totally set you up for that. And, I, and it was kind of fun. I did it on purpose. That is mercy. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. You know what grace would be? Grace would be the contractor shows up, fixes the problem, says, man, your house has had extensive damage. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to remodel your entire house, and I'm not going to charge you. And then he reaches in his pockets, and he says, I'm also going to give you everything I have. That's grace. That's what Christ has done for us. Most Christians do not understand the power of grace. Most Christians do not understand. See, this is what Christ did for us. He just didn't forgive you of your sins. He just didn't show grace on you. He opened up his pockets of heaven and said, all that I have is yours. All that I have is yours. See, that's the difference. It is grace that changes. It is grace that changes people. Grace is different. Grace is, I deserve the bill. Grace is, I deserve the punishment of my actions. I deserve the punishment of my sins. But Christ forgave me. He opened up his pockets of heaven, and he gave me everything that is his is now access to me. See, this is what Paul is talking about. This is also what James is talking about. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and through through, through 10 says for you're saved by grace through faith and this is not what is not from yourselves it is God's gifts not not from work so that no one can boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God has prepared us prepared ahead of time for us to do three prepositional statements in there and so on so important for us to understand this there's three prepositional statements in there by grace through faith prepared for good works, right? And if you get those statements, if you get those prepositions out of order, you're in trouble. And this is what James is saying. This is what Paul is saying. That if you think you earn your salvation, if you think it starts off with works, that I got to work my way to heaven, I got to work my way to forgiveness, that I got to work my way into the kingdom of God, then guess what? You, you have gotten it wrong. You've gotten it wrong. This is what Paul is saying. This is what James is going to say in a few minutes. But here's what I find most of the time in the church. That's not where we get it wrong. That's not where churches get it wrong to where they understand, oh, it's, it's by grace. It's by grace. But they get the next two out of order. This is what James is talking about. They think, oh, it's by grace for good works by faith. In other words... When I accept grace, when I accept the forgiveness of God, I come into the church, I come into the, the kingdom of God. Now it's up to me to work my socks off. Now it's up to me. I mean, now it's the burden is on me. He's forgiven me of my sins, but I got to work. I got to work this thing up and I got to work really hard. I got to work this thing up so that I can have faith. And sometimes that's the gap in the sanctification gap, what we've talked about in this issue, in this series, that, that what I believe versus how I behave in Christian maturity is coming to the place to where we start closing that gap closer and closer and closer. We are saved. Listen, we are saved by grace, by accepting him. So it starts off with grace. But can I just tell you, it is his grace that actually changes you. It is his grace that works in your life. You don't do the good to get grace. You do the good because you have grace. You don't do the works to get grace. You don't do the good to get grace. You do the good. Listen, you do the good because you have grace. You do the good because guess what? He's come into your life. He's forgiven you ever since. The grace of God is working in you. And as a result of that, you understand, oh, now he's prepared me for good works. And now... I'm going to do the good because of the grace that I have received. It's called the sanctification gap. The gap between, the gap between what I believe and how I behave. And listen, all of us, all of us have a gap, me included. And the, the goal is, is it is we walk with him, we start closing that gap more and more. So it's not grace plus works equals faith. That's why that's where that t-shirt came from. Remember when we came out of COVID and all of a sudden it became popular to say, hey, where's your faith? It's because there's a group of people that believe, oh, to have faith, I got to work it up. I got I to gotta work, gotta work it up. I got to work really, really hard to have this. See, there's a lot of people that think 
that when I enter the kingdom of God, it's now my job to work this thing up. It would be, in my mind, it would be like that contractor back to the story that would come over to my house and my basement's flooded, and then the contractor tells me, you know what, I'm going to fix this, and I'm going to remodel your entire house. I'm going to pay for it, and I'm going to empty out my pockets. I'm going to give you everything I have. And I'm like celebrating. I'm like telling my church. I'm telling my friends. I'm telling everybody. And then on Monday morning, the contractor shows up, right, with all of his tools, all of his supplies. And he shows up, and I got my tool belt on. I got my tools out. I have my saw out. I have all this stuff. And I, and I stop him at the curb, and I go, hey, I've already, I've already used your credit card. I mean, I've, I've ordered all the stuff from Lowe's, and it's, it's going to come here. You know what? I don't need you. Stand at the curb. Stand at the curb. I don't need you. I can, I can do this on my own. And if I get in a bind, if like I have a crisis, if I get to something that I don't understand, guess what? I'll call you in for that moment. I'll ask you to bail me out, and then you can go stand on the curb. So many times that's what we do to God. I believe that's why so many Christians do not have joy in the Christian life. Do not have freedom. So many Christians that I talk to have this burden that I got to work harder. I got to do more. I got to work, 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 so hopefully I can work up this thing by faith. And Paul said it's by grace, through faith, prepared for, pre prepared for good works. James, remember, James is fighting a different enemy. James is fighting an en enemy of easy believism. In America, it's rampant. It's rampant about this issue of easy believism that God expects nothing out of me. So here's what, here's what James, uh, I'm sorry, uh, here's what Paul wrote in Colossians. He says, so then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him. So how did you receive him? By faith, by grace. How do you continue to walk in him? By faith, by grace being rooted, built up in him, establishing the faith just as you were taught, and overflowing with gratitude. I believe that's why so many Christians don't have gratitude in the Christian life, because they've got the prepositional statements wrong. They've gotten them out of order, and as a result of that, they have no gratitude. Listen, I'm telling you, gratitude in our life has carried us through brain tumors, carried us through cancer, car carried us through difficult seasons of life. This issue of gratitude has carried us through some of the most difficult times in our life. It is not works that changes you. It is not works that saves you. It is God's grace. Listen, I'm telling you, I, I love spiritual formation. Spiritual formation is how we are changed, how we are formed into the image of Christ. It's what my doctorate is, is based upon. And spiritual disciplines, listen, I, I'm, I'm a spiritual discipline person. I get that. But I want to let you know, Dr. John Coe, I, this isn't mine. This is what he said. He's a professor. He said, spiritual disciplines don't transform you. They bring you to the one that can. That's why prayer is so important. That's why worship is so important. That's why these moments are so important. Listen, this service in of itself does not change you. The goal of this service is to bring you into the presence of God, is to bring you to the one that can change you. See, I don't have to feel the burden. I don't have to feel the job that now i got to change. Everybody that's in this room, it is not up to me. It is up to me to bring you to the one. Guess what? Bring you to the one that can. That's why night of worships are so important. That's why night of worships are so important is we bring people into the presence of God to the one that can change them. So three things I want you to see about this issue of faith. It's the ABCs of, of faith. And, and this is what James says as he compliments what Paul says. And I know that was a long intro, but we just have to understand this as we start walking through what James says. Because I'm telling you, James, is gonna, James can be a little offensive just, just to warn you, just to prepare you. The first A... Uh, of the ABCs of faith is faith is something you announce. It is something that you announce. It's not just something you announce. See, this is James' issue. James' issue is you got to put the ABCs together. I mean, you got to understand this. Look at this. James 2.14 says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can such a faith save him? So James, is, James doesn't say this guy or this girl, we don't know, actually has faith. 
It's that individual that just kind of claims to have faith. He knows all the right things to say, or she knows all the right things to say. She knows some, maybe some scripture. He or she knows uh, some Christianese, if you will, some different Christian fa- phases and uh, phrases. And so, so they, they talk about this issue. They talk about believing in God, and we'll get to that. But when you look at their life, you don't see it in their lifestyle. Today in America, we live in a time of just... Just easy believism. Someone just has to fog a mirror that they believe in God. And we say, you know what, they're, they're a believer, they're a Christian. But it never involves faith in their life. It never changes their life. It never changes their lifestyle. I just need to let you know that not everybody with a Christian bumper sticker is a Christian. Not every politician who claims to know God actually knows him. Not every athlete, not every movie star, not every celebrity that claims to know him actually knows him. See, this is what James is saying. James is saying this issue of Christianity is not just something you announce. It's not just something that you say. If someone, he goes, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works, can such a faith save him? James is saying that it's that person that claims to know God, but you can't see any evidence in their life. You can't see any, and he's not talking about perfection, but he's talking about can you see any evidence in their life, how they, how they love one another, how they love people, how they talk about people? I mean, James is saying, listen, I just need to let you know it's more than emotions. It's more than feelings. It's, it, it's more than, than what you say. I mean, you can be moved emotionally in a service, a Bible study. You can be even be mo- moved emotionally reading Scripture. But that doesn't mean it changes you. I mean, you can go to church and you can get a quiver in your liver. You can get goosebumps, but that never makes a difference in your life. James goes on, verse 15, he says, If a brother or sister is without clothes, lacks daily food... And one of you says to them, go in peace, stay warm and well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs. What good is it? And so James, I mean, James is saying this issue about when you see someone in need, what's in your church, and we can't meet every need, right? But there's some needs that we can, can meet. That's why I'm so thankful for single moms oil change. Instead of us saying, you know, we'll just pray for the single moms, we get involved. And we said, we're going to meet a need. We're going to find a need. We're going to meet it. When there was a church struggling in the Ukraine, we didn't say, you know what, let's just pray for the Ukraine. Let's just pray for that group of people. How can we meet that need? I have an invitation to go to Israel in, in November. And it's going to be totally paid for by the government, the Israeli government, that if I will come over and try to help encourage some of the guides and some of the groups of people that we've worked with. And so when you look at this issue, Christianity is not just saying, we'll pray for you. It's that. But it also says, I, 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 will, I will meet a need. It's, it, it reminds me of the Charles Schultz, you know, the Peanuts cartoons. I don't know if you know this, Charles Schultz, Charlie Brown, you know, that, that guy, uh, he was a Christian. He used his Peanuts cartoon to evangelize, to talk about faith. And so when I, when I looked at this verse, I, I, I picked up, because I, I have a, because my name's Charlie. When I was a kid, everything in my room was Charlie Brown. I had Charlie Brown bedspread. I had Charlie, it was crazy. I had Charlie Brown lunchbox. I hated that. The kids made fun of me. They're, they're bringing cool stuff, and I'm bringing Charlie Brown. And so it was just, it was just low-hanging fruit for my mom. That was an easy way to decorate my room, but I hated it. I hated it. And so I still get gifts of the Peanuts cartoons, and one of them was Charles Schultz. I was given a book of the cartoons that he did, and then what scriptures was it based on? There's a cartoon in the Peanuts um, cartoons uh, that, that, that Charlie Brown and Linus are inside the house, and it's cold night. There's snow everywhere. They're watching Snoopy. Snoopy's out on the doghouse. He's shivering. Uh, his food bowl is empty. His water bowl is, like, frozen. He's cold, and he's hungry. And Charlie Brown and Linus are having this discussion about, oh, man, he must be miserable out there. It must be horrible. Somebody ought to help him. Maybe we should help him. And then the last strip, they, they walk past him, and they say, be of good cheer, Snoopy, and they keep walking. 
Where do you think they got that verse? That he got that verse, he got that cartoon from, from this verse that out of James. Real faith is just not sympathy. Real faith is not, is not emotion. Real faith is when you're willing to give assistance to someone in need. This is fascinating. This is the only place in the New Testament where women are known as sisters, where women are called sisters. He says brothers and sisters. That's why James was important. It was important to him to communicate, guess what? The church, we're a family of God. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. In other words, we help each other. We care for each other. 1 John 3, 17, he put it this way. If anyone has the world's good, sees a fellow believer in need, but withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in him? Compassion is dif different than sympathy. Sympathy is feeling sorry for someone. Compassion is, is sympathy, emotion, and action. It's like meeting a need. Real faith is generous. Real faith meets the needs around them. Let me ask you a question. How many people around you, how many Christians around you have the freedom to call you in the middle of the night? And you'll actually answer your phone. And if they're in a crisis, they'll get out of their car, they'll get out of their bed, get in their car, and they'll come over and they'll sit with you and they'll encourage you and help you. This is what he's talking about. James says this in 2.17. He says, in the same way faith if it does not have works, is dead by itself. And James is saying that if our faith never moves us to action, it's not a sick faith, it's a, it's a dead faith. James says this man never really claimed to have faith. The second thing is this, the B. The B and the ABCs of faith is faith is something you believe. But it's not just something that you believe. Just the same way, it's not just something that you announce. That all of a sudden, you look at this, it's, it's just not something. Look at verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I'll show you my faith by my works. So for some people, it's all about belief. It's not about just announcing. For some people, it's just like an intellectual trip that they're on. And, and the, the scriptures will be studied and debated and talked over and discussed. And they want to stimulate themselves mentally and some of those other things. And so in my Bible, I, I circled, show me your faith. Show me. I don't know if James was from Missouri or not, but he was that type of guy. Just show me. We know he's not from Texas. It'd be, watch this. And then that'd be the famous last words of any Texan, right? He would just say, watch this. And so, but he's not. He's not from Texas, and he may be from Missouri. And when you look at this, James is like, hey, show me your faith. In other words, faith is just not a feeling. Faith is just not an emotion. Faith is just not something that we talk about. That guess what? Faith, faith is, is visible. Faith is apparent. Faith is something that you're able to see. You're able to see the, 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 the results, if you will, of your faith, the actions of your faith. One of the saddest things of being a pastor in my life is when a family gathers in my office or in my conference room and a loved one has passed away, and then you get to that place about, hey, tell me about their spiritual life, tell me about, did they know God? And then all of a sudden they start having this discussion like, well, we, we really don't know. They may have, they may not have. They may have asked Jesus into the heart. They never really shared scripture. I don't know if they ever really read. And they start going through this, and then the family starts wondering, wondering about their faith, and it becomes so awkward in there, but it's totally different when I have a family and we're planning a funeral, and they go, oh man, Oh, man, let me show you their Bible. Let me tell you about their favorite scripture. Let me tell you about this person that they led to the Lord. Let me tell you. Just let me, we know without a doubt that one of the greatest things that you can do for your family is live your life in such a way so that when they gather in, a, in the office of a pastor to plan your funeral, they don't have to wonder where you are. They don't have to wonder about your faith. That they go through that time with, with confidence. Chuck Swindoll said this, faith is like calories. You can't see them, but you can see the results, right? <laughs> and that's what, that's what James is talking about. And I'm telling you, James is like in your face. He's in my face. And James is saying, man, you say you're a Christian, but then, but then prove it. Show me. Let me see your actions. Do you have a desire to, for God? Do you have a desire for his word? Do you love your neighbor? What? Do you love your neighbor as yourself? Do you, under, do you understand that? Listen, if I, if, if I sat down with you, and I've, and I've said this before, that I believe in health, and I believe in eating healthy because my doctor says I need to be on a Mediterranean diet. And I, says, and I say, I believe in the Mediterranean diet. And you say, well, do you follow it? No, I have cheeseburgers all the time. 
Well, do you even follow any of it? Follow any? Of it? No, but I believe I believe it's in, important in, in eating right and eating healthy and, and, and living right. Well, do you exercise? No, I don't exercise. Do you take vitamins? Well, I think I do because I love salami. <laughs> and I have come to believe the white stuff in salami is vitamins. That's what I, I am just sticking to that. Well, if I go through that with you, you would say, you know what? We don't, we're going to. We don't believe you think eating healthy is important. Why? Because your actions don't line up with what you're saying. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. See, the new has come. See, in my mind, in Paul's mind, in James' mind, it is foreign to them to think that something as big as God's grace can step into your life and not change you. That God's grace... Is, not, is, is so big that if it steps into your life, it's going to start the transformation. It's going to start the change in your life, how you see yourself, how you see others, how you see life. James 2.19, I mean, this is when he gets really in their face. You believe that God is one. Good. Even the demons believe. And they shudder. You know what he's saying? It's not just belief. And there are a lot of people that have strong beliefs in God, the Bible, Christ. They can recite creeds, doctrines. They discuss the Trinity and some other things. And James says, well, it's more than that. He says, I need to warn you that the, the demons, the demons believe and they shudder. You know what the word shudder means in the Greek? It's crazy. crazy. It's like watching a, 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 a Stephen King movie to where all of a sudden it scares you to death and your hair stands up. This is what he's saying. He said the demons, they know the Bible backwards and forwards. They, they witness the crucifixion. They witness the resurrection. They witness creation being formed. They witnessed all of that, but you're not going to see them in heaven. Why? Because they've never accepted the grace of God. They have never submitted themselves to his authority. They understand, see, to believe in in the Greek means to trust in, to cling to, to rely on, to completely rest in. This morning when you stepped into this place, you had to have faith and you had to believe that that chair would support you through the entire service. And as a result of that, you put your entire weight in that chair. This is the type of belief that he's talking about, to where you believe this so much that you're putting your, your entire life weight of your life in the hands of him. The third and the last thing to see of the ABCs is faith is something you cultivate. Faith is something you cultivate. And to cult cultivate something, what? It's something that you do. You have to do something. You have to do something with what? With your faith. You have to do something with what you proclaim. You have to do something with what you announce. You have to do something with what you believe. And that leads you to cultivate this in your in your life, faith is the trust in God that he is preparing you for good works, that he can use you. Can I just press in a little bit? And, I'm, it, it, and this isn't like me. When I made that statement that God is preparing you for good works and that God can use you, if you immediately in your spirit had this, were you tensed? And said, oh, you don't know my life. You don't know my past. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've struggled with. Can I tell you then you've got the prepositions out of order? And maybe for you the Christian life is more work than grace. Maybe for you the Christian life is not a lot of joy. Because you don't understand that the grace of God has come into your life, forgiven you of everything, emptied out the, the pockets of heaven, given you everything that he has. Can I just tell you? When you put those prepositions in the right order, by grace through faith, you don't have to work up the works that he has prepared you for. You don't even have to come up with them. to where you got to figure out what you got to do as he presents them to you you understand that faith or grace and faith are working together and you just meet a need you just follow him and James gives a 
illustration to prove this point that faith is not passive, faith is active. And he uses Abraham and Rahab, two totally different people. You may have heard of Abraham, you may not totally know who Rahab is. That's the point of the illustration that James uses. Abraham is a man, Rahab is a woman. Abraham is Jewish, uh, Rahab is a, a Gentile despised race. Abraham is a patriarch. Rahab is a prostitute. Abraham is a somebody. Rahab is a nobody. Abraham is a major character in the Bible, and Rahab is a minor character in the Bible. And he uses this illustration to help you understand it doesn't matter who you are, what family you've come out of, your background, or anything like that, that God wants to use you. See, the only two things, or the only thing that these two people had in common was grace, faith, prepared them for good works. Look at this. James says, you senseless person. So you understand he's pretty fired up mad now. Are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified? We'll come back to justified by works and offering Isaac his son on the altar. You see that faith was active. So now then he shifted, right? Before he was showing you what a dead faith was. And now all of a sudden, now before faith, active. Not dead, but active. He says, Your faith, you see that faith was acted together with works and by works. Faith was made complete, prepared you for good works in advance. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friends. How do we know it? What, what God is saying? Um, that we, we could see it. He, be, he behaved in a way that lined up with what he said. He behaved in a way that lined up with his beliefs. Abraham believed in God, and it was count, counted to him as, right, as righteous. He was called God's friends. This is 25 years before he takes Isaac up to the mountain. So taking Isaac up to the mountain didn't make him a, a God follower. It wasn't works. He was already, he already followed God. He, he was already a believer, if you will. He is saying that, you know what? Abraham proved out his faith. When he took his son up to the mountain, when he gave up, willing to give, give up the thing that was most important to him in his life. Why? Because God is more important. And he went up to the mountain, and he says, he says Isaac and I are going to go up and worship, and we are going to come back. Total trust in God. Total trust in God. And when Abraham talks about Rahab, you can read about Rahab in Joshua chapter 2. In the story of a prostitute in Jericho that, that helped the spies that saved their lives, J James chapter 2, verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. By the same way wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works in receiving the messengers and sending them out by a different route. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also is faith without works is dead. How would you like to be Rahab? In all of scripture, she's known as Rahab the prostitute. And yet God says, I can use her the same way that I used Abraham. That my grace is so big that when it comes into your life, it changes everything. It changes everything. He used that word justified. Justified means, all it means in the Greek and even in the English to prove yourself right. If I go down to the bank and I take out a loan and I pay that loan back 100%, then what have I done? I have proved to my creditor that I've paid it back. I've demonstrated to them what I said that I was going to do, that I, I paid it back. It means to prove that it is true. And when James says justified by work, he means out of your works you have proved that you're right with God. You have shown, like show me, you have shown that guess what? This grace has come in my life, it's changed me. It's changed me. Our belief, behavior many times shows what we believe. So the question that James is asking them, and the question he's asking us, are you a Christian only in name only? What evidence is in your life? What evidence is in your life that you can point to? 
that I have a desire for him. I have a desire for his word. I have a desire to serve him. What evidence in your life that can your family or friends point to? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, test yourself to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourself. Or do you yourselves not recognize that Jesus Christ is in you, his grace, unless you fail the test? What changes can you point to in your life? I mean, this is a sobering thought. The passage that's more sobering than this was when Jesus talked to a group of people that came out of a Bible-believing church. I mean, I mean, they were, they were full on. And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. Is there a point in time in your life to where you accepted him? You accepted his grace to come into your life? Can you point to that time? Do you know that you know that you know? And then what changes started taking place in your life so that you could say, I know, before we take communion, Ephesians 2, 8 and 10, for you are saved by God's grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gifts, not from work, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, whether you're Abraham or whether you're Rahab. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Faith is something you announce. Faith is something that you believe. Faith is something that you cultivate. Faith is something that you do. Something that you live out. Would you bow your heads with me and just close your eyes before we take communion together? Let me just ask you, do you know you are God's workmanship? That God has created you for good works. Have you accepted, have you accepted the grace of God for the forgiveness of your sins? Something my wife and I, in our private devotions at night, we always end the night with, where did I see God working in my life today? And there's something about that. So where's God working in your life? Maybe he's working on something of your character. Maybe he's working in an area of your life. Maybe you could say, you know what, I saw an answer to prayer. I saw a blessing. A friend encouraged. So where is God working? Where is God working? Where is God active? in your life? How do you treat people that are different than you? Grace is an amazing concept until we have to extend it to someone else that we believe doesn't deserve it. Another question we ask remind me of the sins that I have committed and then we confess them is there a sin to confess can I just tell you this you'll never be able to confess sin you will always try to hide it until you understand that God loves you his grace is what changes and you're his workmanship and as a result of that in confession you know he doesn't love you any less And then would you accept, would you accept the forgiveness of God? And maybe you'd like to pray a prayer. We pray a prayer every night similar to this. God of grace, thank you when I was lost, you saved me. And when I was ashamed, you received me. Nailing the accusations to the cross, I receive your forgiveness now. Knowing that if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins.
and we're his workmanship. Father, as we take of the bread and we take of the juice, may we know how much you love us. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. In the seat back in front of you are the elements. You can grab the bread and the juice. The scripture says on the night when the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. And do this in remembrance of me. It's a picture. It's a picture of the grace of God. That he went to the cross on our behalf, took on our sin, and as a result of that, we can have forgiveness of sin. Would you take of the bread with me, please? Scripture goes on and says, after supper, Jesus took the cup and saying, in this cup, it's a new covenant. And also, as often as you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Part of communion is rehearsing salvation. It's remembering salvation. The same way that you were saved is the same way you grow. You're coming to him with grace, forgiveness. Would you take of the juice with me, please? you bow your heads with me and just close your eyes let me ask you just a few minutes I'm going to pray after I pray we're going to stand and if you need prayer in any of your life for any reason we just want to pray for you this is when the church is a church when we're willing just to pray for one another encourage and support one another and this morning if you need prayer in any area we just want to pray for you we're not going to be in this moment long so as you stand up would you just step out and make your way down to the front and then after a few minutes I'll close us with a benediction Father, we thank you for your love and we thank you for your grace. And Father, we just ask that you'd pull this church very close to you. We would know that we are yours and we would respond to you today in prayer. For we would ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me, please? And then as you stand up, just real quickly, if you need prayer in any area of your life, it may be something with your family and you want to pray for someone that's not even here may have to do with your future to where you have a decision to make. You just need wisdom and discernment. You don't know the decision you need to make. It may have to do something with your finances. It may have to do something with your health or a relationship. Or, or maybe you just want to mark something. You just want to show God gratitude and says, I just want to thank God for this answer to prayer. Whatever it is. Whatever it is, we just want to pray for you this morning. So you just make your way to, to the front. Tell us your name and how we can uh, pray for you. And then we would love to have the opportunity to pray for you. We'd love to have the opportunity to encourage you. And then for those of you that are, are standing, there's some connect cards in front of you. You can fill those out with pen and paper or maybe electronically. does not matter to us. Uh, but if you'd like to do it with, with pen and paper, then you can place those completed cards in the, in the boxes. If not, you can grab the QR, QR code. You can do it electronically. And so maybe you want to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Maybe you want to have a conversation with a pastor, get plugged into an area of the church. Whatever it is, we would love to help you. And you can complete those, those that way. And so now for our benediction, may you receive this as the word of the Lord for you. May the Lord bless you. And may the Lord keep you. And may the Lord just make his face shine on you so you know you are his. So you know that you are forgiven. So that you know that you are his workmanship. And may the Lord just be gracious to you. And may the Lord give you peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless you and thank you for being here this weekend.